you know me, but for those of you who don't, Community Cats Podcast is a weekly show that we have that comes out on all of your favorite podcasting locations. And I am the place where you can turn your passion for cats into action. So I want to thank you all for joining us today for Return to Field and Targeting, the Community Cat Program presented by Neighborhood Cats, Brian Cordes and uh, Susie Richmond. So um, I am just going to do a little check here. If you have your go to webinar control panel, uh, go into that questions box and just let me know if you can see me or if you can hear me, just so I can make sure we're doing a little bit of a tech check. If you are having any issues with technical issues, you can't hear me, you can't see me, put it in that questions box. Kristen is here to help you uh, get technologically um, engaged. Uh, hello, Donna from Long Island. Great to see you. Um, and Carol, and I see Susan, she's got a little need some help. I know Kristen will be there. Ruth, yes, and yes, you can see me and you can hear me, so that's fantastic. Um, if you have taken a webinar from Community Cats Podcast, if you have been to one of our events before, if you can put that in the questions box just to let me know if you've been here so I know how many people know about uh, GoToWebinar or how much training I need to do here to get you all on board. But it looks like lots of people can see me. Susan, hello, Sammy, uh, Julie. Jen, excellent, excellent, great. Some of you have been here before, so this is excellent. So good to see some familiar names as well as it's fantastic to see new names. The more people that we can have here helping Community Cats, the better off we are all going to be. So excellent. Amanda, first time, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending, Sammy, great and someone who attended last week. So last week we had a trapper certification workshop. For those of you who don't know, we do uh, trapper certification workshops uh, once a month. Uh, our next one is gonna be on December 4th and I have a feeling Brian will probably talk about that during his um, presentation. Excellent, hi, hey, Corrine, excellent. Thank you for joining us. Um, and she was with us. She was a presenter at Return to Field Day. Return to Home Day. I'm sorry, Return to Home Day. Um, and she is a pet detective. That's what I'm going to say. She's a super cat detective. Um, fantastic. I'm so glad everybody's here. So one other thing that I love to do also is polls. So I'm going to do a quick poll just so we can see who's in the room before we do all the introductions. And I am going to launch our poll so we can see who is here. Who is here? Who are you? Are you a volunteer working on my on your own? Are you animal control? Do you work with a rescue? TNR, are you foster based? Uh, do you work with an animal shelter? So we have 49% of you, you're a volunteer. You're just working on your own, trying to help community cats, which is fantastic. 36% of you work with a rescue TNR foster based organization. And then we have 16% of you who work at an animal shelter. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us. It's an interesting distribution. It's a little bit different than what we see in our TNR certification classes. So we have a different audience today. So is there a return to field program operating in your area? Um, Brian may talk a little bit about how you define that, but for as you define it, um, please answer yes or no. And if you don't know, or you don't really know what it is, we have that as an option too. So we have 41% of you have a return to field program. We have 12% without, uh, not yet, but there will be a one soon is at 7% and 39% uh, of you don't know and that's totally fine, that is okay. Susie Richmond is the executive director of Neighborhood Cats. She joined the organization after over 20 years running a major New York City shelter and nonprofit veterinary clinic. At Neighborhood Cats, she has led multiple targeted, large targeted TNR projects in New York City and Northern New Jersey, managed a program for providing scholarships to veterinarians for training in high volume spay neuter of community cats and co-authored the Humane Society of the United States online course on TNR. In her spare time, she can often be found trapping feral cats on Maui. And our presenter today, Brian Cordes, is co-founder and national programs director for Neighborhood Cats a leading community cat advocacy group with hands-on programs in New York City, New Jersey, and Maui. Currently, he and his wife, Susan Richmond, live in Hawaii and can usually be found trapping cats or releasing them after they've been neutered. In between stints with neighborhood cats, he served as a grants manager for PetSmart Charities, overseeing over $21 million in TNR and special spay-neuter projects. He has produced many of the leading educational materials on trap-neuter return, including award-winning books, 
and videos, has assisted numerous communities in setting up large-scale TNR programs, and is a frequent pre presenter on community cat issues. Brian has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Cornell University and a JD from the University of California at Berkeley. And before I turn it over to Brian, I will also say we're going to take a little pause in the middle of the presentation, and we will, of course, without fail, have a little bit of cat trivia. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you for taking time out today uh, to talk about, um, you know, often in our our presentations with the Community Cats podcast, we're talking about ground level work, uh, trapping, colony caretaking, uh, the, the whole hands-on TNR process. And today, a little bit different, we're going to talk more about strategy and what a TNR program can look like on a community-wide scale. But before we get going, I just want to make sure that we're all um, using the same terms. So when we talk about a community cat uh, today, we're talking about basically cats who are free roaming and they're unowned in any traditional sense. So people also refer to them as ferals, uh, sometimes as strays, uh, but the basic thing is they're, they're free roaming and they're not traditional pets. Now it's important to realize that uh, the term community cat came around because uh, feral, for example, is a behavioral description and not all community cats are feral. They exist on a whole range of socialization uh, from uh, cats who may be uh, quite friendly to cats who may be quite feral. But they all share uh, the characteristic of free roaming and unowned. Now, when we talk about colonies, what we're talking about is a group of community cats who share a common food source and a common territory. Uh, now, a group can be one or more, um, as long as they have those characteristics of the same food source and, and uh, the same territory. And they could even include uh, roaming uh, pet cats. So, uh, you know, at, at least to some extent, they may come and the pet cats may come and have a bite to eat or hang out with the, the community cats. But sometimes we do find pets in colonies. So what is return to field? And this is the basic schematic that um, describes it. So we, we've got, starting off on the upper left, we've got uh, a cat who's uh, a community cat. He's free roaming. He's unowned. Uh, somebody captures him. Typically, we're talking about uh, a, a private citizen who um, just doesn't want the cat around for whatever reason. Uh, sometimes we have animal control coming and responding to a complaint. Most of the time, it's, it's a private citizen. So the cat is trapped and brought to the local shelter. So in the old days, that was um, the, the cat, if the cat was unadoptable for whatever reason, either because of lack of space or uh, lack of a, a suitable temperament, the good chance uh, the cat would be euthanized. And that would be the end of the line. If the cat was friendly and there was capacity for care, then the cat would be put up for adoption. Now with return to field, Instead, what happens is the cat is spayed or neutered, given a chance to recuperate overnight, uh, ear tipped, uh, and then transported right back where he was found and uh, originated and released. So he ends up basically right back where he came from, but now he's fixed and vaccinated and ear tipped. That's what we mean by return to field. So where did, it, I think it's interesting for people to understand where this came from because it's not, uh, you know, it's only been around since 2008. And it originated in Jacksonville that you see circled on the map here with a group called First Coast No More Homeless Pets, which was uh, and is a high volume spay neuter clinic, but also is involved in other animal welfare issues in their community. So they met with uh, the local county animal control agency and, and animal shelter uh, agency, Jacksonville Animal Care and Protective Services, and they asked the shelter if they would return ear tip, let them return ear tip cats to their colonies. 
that was meant as a way of starting to build support for TNR in the community. So the thinking was that if people uh, engaged in the TNR process, they would know that their cats were protected. And if they ever ended up in the county shelter, uh, they would be notified and the cats would be returned to their location. So the director of the animal uh, shelter thought about it and he came back and said, well, not only can you have the ear tipped cats, you can have all of them. <laughs> and if you agree to fix them and return them, then all uh, impounded community cats would be handed over to you. And that was uh, quite the daunting uh, challenge, but they uh, First Coast took it on and they had uh, a lot of support from Best Friends Animal Society. And they launched this program where basically all cats who otherwise would have been euthanized for whatever reason were instead uh, fixed and brought back. And this is a, a graph of the results. And um, the one that you wanna pay most attention to at this time is the red bars. That's, that's youth, the cat number of cats who were being euthanized. So you could see in the year 2007, before the program began, and the program began in August of 2008, the shelter was euthanizing over 11,000 out of about 13,000 cats. So a really high number and a really high percentage. You can see that um, starting in 2008, the euthanasia rate, the numbers started going down and they went down by the green bar, which is the number of cats who were returned to field. So there was a one-to-one -one relationship in this program between cats returned and euthanizations avoided. So 2009, you start to see the first full year and you see the euthanasia numbers drop quite dramatically and you see them falling every year after that. And by the time you get to 2014, you're about five or 600 cats being euthanized compared to 2007 when there were 11,000. So obviously this was a huge change um, and it caught the attention of um, the animal welfare field as a whole. And then these programs started to uh, proliferate around the country. So why stop euthanizing? Um, you know, why is return to field a, a, a better policy in the view of, um, you know, many in the field now? Well, the problem with euthanizing, which was kind of the traditional approach to community cats for decades, prior to 2008. And the reason is because no matter what communities were finding, um, like in Jacksonville, was no matter how many cats they euthanized, their intake never went down, uh, the number of cats being euthanized never went down. At best, they might stay steady, which basically indicates that the re-roaming population was at its carrying capacity, uh, meaning there was, the number of cats matched the human population in terms of food and shelter that was available. And nothing, you know, it was just, it was just a go round that never went anywhere. Um, same thing with complaint calls. Uh, they never uh, did not see improvement. And, you know, that all reflected, as I say, that the number of community cats was not going down. Um, again, at best steady. And if you were in an area with a rising human population, good chance you would see all these different metrics going up and, and not staying steady. At the same time, euthanasia as a policy um, has been recognized as having quite a few, even though there's very few benefits to it, there's quite a bit of cost to it. Um, number one is high stress. So there have been a number of uh, published uh, studies that have been done on the mental health of shelter workers who are regularly exposed uh, to the euthanasia of healthy animals who, who are actually directly involved, not necessarily the person at the front desk, but certainly the euthanasia tech or the people who have to deal with the bodies or whatever direct involvement there is. That class of shelter workers 
has an extremely high rate of mental illness. Um, we're talking uh, substance abuse problems, um, psychological conditions, suicide rates, uh, substance abuse. So that's quite a, quite a quite a high cost, and of course that then ends up resulting in quite a high turnover as people cycle through uh, these agencies. Uh, now, uh, fairly or not, and 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 usually not fairly. Usually, these shelters have been um, kind of designated by our society as a whole to be the place that you know has to deal with this stuff. Uh, with very few options, and they end up, um, well, you know, if you've got 20 cages and there's 40 cats waiting to come in and the cages are all full, you don't have a whole lot of choice about what you're going to do. But nonetheless, the public uh, blames the shelter for its uh, practices. And even if they don't blame them, people tend to, you know, associate a high euthanasia environment as an unpleasant one that they don't want to be in. So high euthanasia rates tend to lead to very poor public relations, um, which is then uh, translated to uh, difficult, you know, low fundraising, also lower adoptions. You know, it doesn't make sense. You would think, you know, in a logical world that um, people would want to adopt from agencies where the animals are in the most need, but in fact, they tend to stay away. So um, it's a really important thing to understand the underpinning of return to field to know why doesn't lethal control work? Um, you know, why do the numbers not go down? Why doesn't intake drop? If you're euthanizing thousand, you know, eleven thousand cats in a year, how come that doesn't make a dent in any of this of the data? And that that's not true for just just true for Jacksonville. You could really look at any shelter that has had a history of high euthanasia, and you're most likely going to find the same thing. So, well, here's the reasons why. I mean, there's too many cats and there's too few animal control resources. So, you know, there's just not enough manpower to run around and catch, you know, the cats are constantly reproducing. So you would have to capture and euthanize them at a rate that's outpaces their reproduction. And that would just take an army of animal control officers, you know, who were um, in any one community who were willing to, you know, spend their time doing this. And that is just not a realistic scenario in, in almost every community. You also have the fact that the people who feed the cats, the caretakers, are very bonded to them. Uh, they regard the cats, uh, they love them just as much as anyone loves their pet cats. And uh, they don't just go along with having the cats hauled away and, and euthanized. They may um, just withhold information so if you don't, if you're out trapping and you don't know how many cats are at that location, it's rather difficult to do an effective job. Uh, they may feed the cats before a trapping takes place. Um, some of them may even go as far as tripping the traps. So very difficult to have an effective program when the people on the ground are resisting you. If you don't capture all the colony members, which is usually the case, with these kind of uh, lethal control efforts, uh, the people doing the trapping don't know how many cats are there. They tend to, it tends, they don't have time to hang out for hours uh, observing the location. They tend to put some traps out and whoever goes in gets hauled away. But that usually means a number of cats are left behind. And now these cats uh, are, you know, will reproduce with less competition for resources. And then there's the, phenomenon that's uh, referred to as the vacuum effect. So let me ask real quick, and you guys can put in the questions box, um, are you from, how, how many of you are familiar with the vacuum effect or have heard of it at some point? It's a pretty common concept in the animal welfare field, but not a lot of understanding about what it really means. So, so yep, we're getting a lot of yups and um, some knows what is it. Okay, so it's so important to understanding 
why lethal control doesn't work and why return to field is, in, in my opinion, um, a better policy that I'm going to make all of you vacuum effect experts right now. Okay, so let's start off at a grocery store that we call Ralph's, um, and or I call them Ralph's. And we're talking about a scenario here where there are um, 10 cats. Well, well let's, let me start. This is a grocery store, and the, the garbage can is meant to be a dumpster. Okay, that's, that's the best I could do with clip art. But that's a dumpster. Every day, the, you know, the wasted food and stuff gets thrown out there. And on a regular basis, there's enough food to support 10 cats. Um, so that's what's referred to as the carrying capacity of any particular location, is how much food is available. How many cats can that food source support? Now, of course, if you have a, a, a feeder, you know, a human being who comes by and puts food out for the cats every day, well, that carrying capacity might increase as the number of cats increases. But, you know, it's going to reach a limit at some point, um, whether, it, it, the, you know, in terms of before the neighborhood rises in revolt and, and the cats are hauled away or the person can't afford to feed anymore. But it's just an easier concept to understand with something like a grocery store where the amount of food that's put out is constant. So at this particular grocery store, we have enough food in the dumpster to support 10 cats. And that's what we have. We have a 10 cat colony here. When they get beyond 10 cats, because you know they continue to give birth. So let's say there's 10 now, and then there's two litters born. Well, now you've, you'll have 18 cats and only enough food for 10. That's when you start to see things like disease and FELV and FIV spreading rapidly throughout a colony. Um, you know, uh, that's when you'll see cats uh, migrating. They'll go off out of the territory in search of new food sources or pregnant cats um, will, in order to protect their kittens from um, male cats who, who, if there's not enough food and stuff, may kill the kittens, they'll go off to try to find some isolated area. So nature kicks in at the point when carrying capacity is exceeded until the balance is achieved again. So, um, but somebody complains and doesn't want the cats around anymore, uh, calls animal control, they're very good at their job, and boom, no more cats. But what's the problem? Anybody want to try to guess in the questions field? I'll just give you a moment. How come this, all right, if you're from the perspective of somebody who doesn't want cats around, what's wrong with this situation? There's no cats around now, right? All right, um, somebody nailed it. If the food is still still available, right? There's still a food source. Uh, the environment is unchanged. Uh, whatever it was that attracted the cats to be there in the first place is still there. And it's really important to understand that Ralph's grocery store is not an island. It's it's part of a neighborhood, and that neighborhood has cat colonies and community cats uh, all over the place, right? And they're not altered, they're intact, so they're breeding, they have their own carrying capacity, they're gonna run out of food, and what's gonna happen is before too long, usually it can happen within days, sometimes weeks, sometimes a little longer, Adam and Eve are gonna come along and discover this untapped food source and they're going to say, hey, a nice territory, no competition, plenty of food. Uh, you and I are attracted to each other. Uh, why don't we settle down and we'll start a family? And boom, within a couple of breeding cycles, you're right back up to 10 cats. So the vacuum of that you created by removing all the cats is now filled. This typically happens within 6 to 12 months you end up with the exact same number of cats, or not exact, but pretty close to the same number of cats that you started with. And all you've accomplished is turnover, but you haven't you know, uh, accomplished reduction. You have uh, new furry faces, but you don't have fewer of them. 
and this scenario plays out over and over and over again in communities that rely on lethal control. Now, on the other hand, um, what are the benefits of return to field? You know, well, let me let me let me also point out that the futility of lethal control is also, you know, it, it creates the question, like, so what's the point? You know, what's the point of euthanizing all these original cats um, when you consider all the costs that are involved with euthanasia, the costs of, um, you know, high stress, high turnover, uh, poor relations, um, lower adoptions. So why bother, you know, if you're not changing the outdoor situation? So here's the benefits. You, you uh, as we see, saw in the Jacksonville gra uh, graph, it's a one-to-one -one relationship in terms of euthanasia. For every cat you return to field, that's one less cat that's dying in the shelters. Uh, the program frees up resources. So when you're euthanizing uh, 500 cats a year instead of 11,000, um, that's an awful lot of money and staff time and um, other resources that can go to other more productive programs where you might accomplish something besides turnover. Uh, maybe um, you put it into a spay neuter program or you put it into dog behavioral programs or whatever it might be. It's not being wasted on a merry-go-round um, that, that doesn't change anything in the community or change anything in the shelter. You also end up with a healthy, healthier, and there are um, published studies about this, you end up with a healthier shelter environment. And the main reason is because in a return to field program, the cats are moving, they, they, they should be housed separately from the general shelter population, and they should be moving in and out of the shelter as quickly as possible. As a result, you end up with less crowding and less disease, less stress, and just a healthier environment uh, for the cats. Public support goes up. Uh, now all of a sudden you've got a high live release rate instead of a high euthanasia rate. Uh, again, we're not talking fairness here. We're talking about the reality that we see and um, fundraising and adoptions start to go up because uh, people are, are drawn to um, a situation where uh, they feel like uh, it's, lives are being saved. Culture change, both inside and outside the shelter and let me explain that a little bit. So inside the shelter, um, you know, the vast majority of people who enter the animal welfare field uh, enter it because they want to help animals. And they don't um, enjoy seeing healthy animals uh, dying, and they don't enjoy being part of the process that makes that happen. But they often and correctly feel they have little to no choice other than leave the job. So when I, I've been there at a couple of major, uh, you know, city citywide uh, shelters where return to field programs were introduced, and the in, the change inside the culture is just astonishing. Um, when you unleash people's life-saving capacity and, and you say, yeah, no, we want you to do things that are going to get these cats out of here alive. Uh, it, it just completely changes everything. Um, I'll give you one example. In uh, San Antonio, uh, Texas, where uh, best friends uh, and worked with the municipal shelter to start a return to field program, and I was working with PetSmart Charities at the time, and we were funding a lot of this. Well, San Antonio is a city of about 1.1 million people, at least it was at the time, maybe more now. Uh, the city was too big for us to try to cover the entire um, city. So what we did was we basically split the city in half and um, the return to field, it was a combination of return to field and targeted TNR, which I'll talk about the targeted TNR part in the second half of the presentation today. But the return to field part only involved half of the city because other, you know, if you take your resource and you resources and you spread them too thinly, you you can end up accomplishing nothing. So you have to match the area you're working in with the resources you had. And we felt that we could only really cover half of the city. 
So cats that came in from the return to field half came in the shelter, got fixed, went out alive. Not the same um, trajectory for cats who came from the zip codes that were not included in the program. So uh, the animal control officers, the people who worked in the shelter, felt like, wow, this is really arbitrary. You know, the cat is living or dying depending on the zip code of origin. You know, that just didn't feel right to them. And I understand that. Um, so what they did was they went out and they got their own separate grant funding to pay for the surgeries for the cats from the non-target areas and then they uh, uh, returned them themselves on their own time. So that's how much change there was uh, inside the shelter. Um, I'll give you one other example. In Albuquerque, there was a, a, a veterinary technician who really bucked the trend and um, stuck with the, even though euthanasia had been the um, dominant form of control for you know, 20 years, she stuck with it, even though she hated it, but she stuck with the job and she, she did you know, her job and did her work. And when the Return to Field program launched, she asked if she could come uh, when the first cats were being released. And of, of course the staff said yes, and she went with them, they opened the door of the trap, the cat went running out and she just burst into tears. You know, she was just so overcome with uh, joy to see this transformation. So it's, it's a profound change inside the shelter itself. Outside the shelter, it's a slower process, but it's still equally profound. And what it is is, Community looks to the shelter, especially when there's one uh, dominant animal welfare agency in a community, which is usually the case. The community, you know, people uh, have their own jobs. They have different professions. They're not thinking animal welfare 24 seven like we all are. So they, they're not experts and they don't try to be experts and they look to the shelter for leadership like, what do I do when I have a problem with an animal? You know, well, I call you up, you give me advice, or I see what your policies are, and I, I just thinkingly or unthinkingly go along with that. So when the leader in the community, the leader in animal welfare starts to say, hey, we have a overpopulation of cats here, but we're not gonna solve this problem by uh, trying to remove them with lethal control. We're going to uh, spay and neuter them and let them live, and that's how we're gonna solve the problem. Well, that's how people start to think. And um, so when we introduced Trap New to Return, Neighborhood Cats did on a, on a large scale to New York City, you know, people who cared about the cats would call up, they'd be like, the first thing they wanted to do is relocate them, right? That was always the first question is, what do I do? How can I get them out of here? But after 10 years of TNR, when people called, they would say, how do I get them fixed? So the culture shifted and the same thing happens with return to field where um, people who for years and years and years have been taught, like you got a problem with a community cat, you know, come get a trap, catch them, bring them in, we'll take care of the rest. Now they're learning that, oh, actually I should be getting them fixed well, over the years, that will take holds more and more and more. Um, finally, another benefit of return to field is, you know, there are roaming pets. A lot of people let their cats, their pet cats roam. Um, I think that's unfortunate. You know, I wish we had a, a culture that's more of a let your cats outside, but in a safe way, you know, in a catio or in a cat fenced in yard or something like that, um, or, you know, train them to be happy indoors, which is perfectly possible. Still, you know, uh, like here uh, where I am in, on the island of Maui in Hawaii, everybody lets their cats outside. So at any one time when a, uh, a cat is brought in, if the cat's not microchip or wearing identification, there's a very good chance that cat's going to act frightened, which could easily be interpreted as feral. And if decisions are made rapidly, which they often are in situations that are crowded, 
um, that cat ends up being put down. And what was really an owned pet who um, would have just, if you would put him back uh, where he was found, he would have just found his way home. Instead, he dies. And we have no idea how often that is happening. Um, but we do know with a return to field program uh, that risk is, is minimized. So even if you, you know, if, if you're persuaded that this is a policy worth exploring, usually what happens, the first question is, isn't everybody going to freak out? You know, aren't they going to storm the shelter with pitchforks and torches uh, once they find out that you're putting, um, you know, feral and stray and uh, community cats back out on the street, right? That's a, a fear that everybody who thinks about uh, having this program in the beginning, everybody has that, right? Um, so here's here's so let's let's put fear aside for a moment and try to look at some objective data. Um, so th I'm going to just go over a couple of, of surveys before you decide. Oh, they're biased. Um, they were commissioned, meaning they were paid for by animal welfare agencies, but they were conducted by independent polling agencies like Harris and uh, Gallup. I don't remember the specific ones, but they were um, not conducted by the animal welfare agencies. So in this one in 2007, uh, the question was if you saw a stray cat and you could only choose between having the cat caught and put down or just leaving the cat where the cat is, uh, what would you choose? Right. And the results were, you know, kind of surprising at the time. Eighty one percent. And this is a national national representative, nationally representative survey. Eighty one percent, four out of five people said, leave the cat. Where the cat is. Um, uh, only 14 percent thought that euthanizing the cat was the best alternative. So unless at least we think that was some type of aberration. Another survey, national survey, was done in 2014. This time, the question was a little bit different. Now, people were given three choices. One, A was basically TNR. So if you have stray cats, should you TNR them? Uh, B was, uh, you know, have the cat trapped and then euthanized. And C was just leave the cats alone um, and don't do anything for them. And the results were here and we see 68% uh, supported TNR. Uh, another 8% said just leave them alone. So you end up with 76% of, of people who wanted to just let the cats live. Uh, fortunately, most of those 76% also wanted them fixed. And only a quarter of the respondents wanted uh, thought the best thing to do was to euthanize the cats. So. Um, what this tells us is that uh, most people out there um, are fine with the cats in their community, and they would um, prefer that they were fixed, but they don't want them killed. And it, it's a distortion. This is a surprise. These, these results are often a surprise to people who um, are in the animal welfare field, especially if you work for an open admission shelter or are um, involved with animal control. And I've thought about that. And my theory is that um, there's, a, there's a real distortion of what kind of information you're getting when you're in those situations, when you're in an open admission shelter, when you're in animal control. And the distortion is that when people contact you about community cats, it's almost universally negative. Um, they're calling because they don't want them there. They're calling because they think they're a problem. They're calling to complain. They're calling because they want you to get rid of them. So if that's all you're hearing, it's easy to interpret that as um, the vast majority of people don't want the cats around and they're gonna go nuts and we're gonna lose our jobs and our funding if we start a return to field program. But 
when you think about it, how, you know, the people which these surveys suggest is the vast majority of people who like the cats. Do they call you? Do they call you up to say, hey, thanks for leaving the cats alone in my backyard? You know, or hey, just wanted to let you know you're doing a great job by um, letting Fluffy, you know, come and visit me twice a day. Uh, no, I mean, you don't hear anything from the silent majority and you wouldn't know they were there unless you did these kinds of surveys. So, you know, consider that uh, when, when you're uh, um, thinking like, hmm, you know, the, that and and the reality you, you also we also have now, you know, was it 13 years of experience with return to field programs and uh, the pitchforks and, and torches have not come out. Um, not that it's always a smooth ride. There are definitely bumps in the road, but, um, you know, funny enough that the, the main resistance to return to field programs has not been from the general public, not at all. It's actually been from the rescue community over the issue of friendly cats being returned to field. That's where um, the controversy and the disruption have come from. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. Here's more, you know, statistical support for the fact that there's a huge uh, percentage of our population that likes the cats. And this was a survey done in 2008 of Ohio adults. And there's a lot of great information in this study, but the points I want to bring out now were that almost half of the participants have had seen free roaming cats in their neighborhoods on a regular basis. And almost uh, more than a quarter of them had actually been feeding free roaming cats at some point during the prior year. Again, this points to um, the general uh, acceptance of return to field in the community or of the community cats being there. So my conclusion you know, from all this data is that return to field is actually a program that's more aligned with the majority of the community um, who favors live outcomes and are willing to leave the cats in their environment. And euthanasia, lethal control, is aligned with the very loud minority who is complaining about them and wants them removed. And what a shelter needs to decide or anybody who's, you know, a health agency, whoever's responsible in the community for animal um, control policy is which part of this community are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the majority who likes the cats there, or at least the majority that's suggested by the data that we have? Or are you going to throw in your lot with um, the people who are complaining? Return to field serves one, uh, but certainly not the other. So what are some of the common fears uh, besides that everybody's going to freak out? Um, uh, number one fear is that people will harm the cats. You know, they brought them in because they don't want them there. You put them back exactly where they came from. You're inviting abuse. It, uh, a common fear, um, but not one that, and, and, and a risk for sure. And this is part of why you need to have good processes in place. If you have a return to field program, you need to um, thoroughly interview the people who bring the cats in. You need to get as much background as possible so that, you know, there, look, most people are not um, violent. Uh, they are not going to harm an animal, even if they're angry about your policy. Now, every once in a while, there is somebody with a couple of screws loose and you need to have processes in place that will allow you to pick that person out. Um, uh, but you need to base that on objective data, like there's been abuse in the area before, or this guy's been a problem before, or whatever it might be. Um, there's been some mysterious deaths in the area, something objective, but a general fear that people will be unhappy enough to the point where they're going to harm the animals is not something that has been reported, and this is now we're 13 years in, we're not seeing widespread abuse as a result of this program. And that's because, you know, most people are, are, are um, decent and uh, again, are not going to go to the point of actually physically harming another creature. So another fear is people are gonna, you know, the people who are used to dropping off cats at the shelter 
problem solved, at least, you know, for a few months, um, they're going to complain, you know, especially if you're receiving any type of government funding or, or the shelter has a government contract. And um, the answer to that is yes, they will. Um, they absolutely will complain. And that's why before you launch a return field program, it's very important to educate the government officials and the policymakers in your area about what you're doing and why you're doing it. It doesn't mean if you don't have to that you need to ask their permission, but you need to inoculate them. You need to let them know the policy behind this. You need to know what you're trying to accomplish, what your benchmarks are, um, and you need to let them know, be prepared. Some people are going to call you up and complain about what we're doing. So at least you've inoculated and it's not a surprise because that's when you get into trouble. When people start calling their council members and complaining and they don't know anything about it all of a sudden, and because they're getting all the information from the person who's complaining. They're not, they don't know anything about why what you're doing and they may just take their constituent side without really knowing that they're doing that um, and without any countervailing information. So be smart about it and lay the groundwork and you won't run into serious problems with the government officials. And if there is really a serious problem, then you'll know about it before you launch the program instead of after. Um, there's also a fear that uh, since the cats, the return to field cats tend to cycle through quickly, that cat owners won't have an opportunity to find their cats to go to the shelter and to reclaim them. Um, well, the reality is sadly that the, the number of cats who are reclaimed uh, is only 2%. So um, many studies have shown that if you uh, take a pet cat and you, and you put that cat back in their own territory, they have a far greater chance of returning home than if they sit at the shelter waiting for their owner to come to them. So let's let's touch on that um, controversial subject, which is friendly cats. And as I say, the problems return to field programs have run into um, have not been the general public saying, oh, you know, how could you put these cats back out here? It's come from rescuers who think that the shelters are using return to field programs as a way of bolstering their live release rate numbers and are taking adoptable cats and dumping them on the street. That's the stereotype. Um, now, some of, some of this criticism has um, been caused by the animal welfare field, by the return to the field programs themselves, because they have not messaged well um, when the criticism comes, there's a tendency to be opaque and not to explain what you're doing or why. Um, there's also been, um, uh, the, the field has become too ideologically um, bent, uh, too, too rigid in their thinking about friendly cats and return to field. And it's, be, it's become this kind of black or white um, issue. And that's what it, at the bottom there, when I say, you know, avoid an autopilot approach. So some shelters have policies where um, every cat who's above a certain age, like say over the age of four months, whatever their temperament is, whatever their circumstances are, um, unless it's, you know, a very, very dangerous situation, um, they're going to fix the cat and put the cat back and they don't care whether the cat's friendly or not. Um, and then you have shelters who are just the opposite extreme, who any cat that's friendly uh, and potentially adoptable is never going to be returned to field. And when you have that kind of a black or white approach, that's when you get into trouble because you miss all the nuances. You, you, every situation, you know, having been involved in two return to field programs myself, one in which I drove, my, Susie and I drove the cats back um, we were the drivers and another program where we're the deciders where we make have made the decisions about which cats go back every cat is a different situation every circumstances are unique so every what what we advise in order to avoid this controversy is to take um, first of all to be transparent let let the community know what your decision making protocol is and and don't go on autopilot 
consider each cat individually. And the factors that you have to take into account include these, like, so what's the capacity for care, right? If you're in uh, the middle of kitten season and you're 120% capacity and your foster homes are all filled and you've got a friendly cat um, who looks like he could, you know, might belong to someone or has done quite well in his community outdoors, that may be your best option uh, for that cat. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you don't know the cat situation or you think it might be risky and you've got plenty of open cages and a high, a good adoption rate, then it may be better to keep the cat in. Um, what's the cat's history? So when you do return to field, as I've said before, there should be a vigorous interviewing process of the person who brings the cat in. Um, and you should find out, you know, how long has the cat been seen in the area? Um, what were the circumstances? And, and that kind of information, if you're knowledgeable about outdoor cats, can really uh, tell you what's going on. So, for example, we had a cat who um, had never been seen before, appeared on somebody's porch, wouldn't leave the porch for two weeks. Um, but just stayed there and would cry and then the person started to feed them and they just would never leave the porch. Okay, that's not, a, and, and was very friendly, that's not a cat who belongs, who, who's been part of that community. That's a, probably a cat who was abandoned or was lost. Um, and then they just took refuge and were frightened and just stayed there. Uh, on the other hand, we've had cats where they've been known to be in the area for years and people actually complained when somebody brought the cat and start calling the shelter like what did you do with our cat so that's a friendly cat too but that cat is doing great in the community and thriving as wanted there and that's a good time to return them so that's why you need that history keep in mind too that you know with trap near to return programs in general there's a goal of reducing the free roaming population so you know we this is our own bias at neighborhood cats but if all things are equal we're going to place the cat in a home because that's one less cat on the street um, if we don't have information that leads us to believe the cat would do well. Uh, so we recommend an individual assessment of what is the best available outcome considering everything that is involved in, in, in your shelter, in your community, and with that particular cat. And don't do a black or white thing because that's when you start automatically putting friendly cats back, you're going to end up with some really upset rescuers, and sometimes rightfully so. I mean, I've seen some of the cases that have led to lawsuits and over friendly cats being put back. Well, I shouldn't say lawsuits, I wanna over dramatize it. There's one that's going on right now that I'm aware of. And when you look at the facts of that case, it was pretty questionable putting that cat back. Um, and I think they did it because they just went on autopilot. The cat came from outside, the cat goes back outside. So don't do that and you will stay out of trouble. So when, if you're interested in return to field and the mechanics of it, like the interview process, um, like how to house them, um, what are all the factors that go into assessing the eligibility of a cat, um, including age and temperament and health and things like that. So uh, HSUS, um, Alley Cat Advocates and Neighborhood Cats, we all got together and decided that, you know, we kept seeing return to field programs starting and people uh, having no resources to, oh, everybody had to start from scratch or word of mouth. So we put together a handbook that is uh, very much a um, meant as a reference material that goes over all the different uh, mechanical aspects of, of return to field, including messaging to the community, um, uh, again, lists, checklists for before you return the cat. You know, a lot of real practical hands-on information. You can either download a free PDF copy of um, this handbook, or you can buy a print copy if you go to the link that's on this slide. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I, I should have mentioned this at the very beginning, and I forgot. So, all the if you one of the handouts today is all the slides that you're seeing right now. So don't try to scribble down this um, uh, this link. Just download the PDF and you'll be able to uh, click on the link later.
Okay, before we go to break, um, I just thought we'd have a little eye candy and show you um, uh, some of the returns we've done here in Maui. Brian, do you have a couple minutes for some quick, some questions out there? Oh yeah, absolutely. Great, super. So um, there were definitely a lot of questions out there uh, more about, you know, predation, the bird situation and that, and that kind of stuff. And you may be covering that in the second part. So if I am touching upon things for the, for the second half, just say, we're going to talk about that. But okay. I, I, was, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your transition from going from New York, which has more seasonal, it's got the cold winter. We were just talking before we hit the recording about the fact that there's fewer kittens to deal with. And then going to Maui and, and your experience with um, you and Susie going to Maui, what you thought you were going to run into with regards to trap, neuter, return, and, and you know, how were you received there? Well, we, we expected, you know, especially the island of Maui was always known as uh, Miaui in the uh, <laughs> cat animal welfare world because of the you know extreme overpopulation of free roaming cats and um there's uh, uh, what you what you hear if you listen to national media is a lot of propaganda uh from the conservation community about how the cats are wiping out all the endangered species and um they actually run they used to run tv ads against the cats on local um television stations and radio spots. So we expected to walk into a very hostile environment when it came to trap, neuter, return. Uh, and uh, we thought it would take probably at least a year or two before we really ever got going with the hands-on work. And what we found was the exact opposite. We found people so eager for help um, that, you know, when we would offer to, because the Maui Humane Society opened a, um, a free community cat spay neuter program and we would do a lot of the trapping and when we offered to people like hey we'll it's not going to cost you anything you just got to work with us we'll get your cats trapped and fixed and bring them back they were falling over themselves to to get that service and in fact um we, we like right now we don't we're not doing all that much trapping because the clinics are all full without us um they're doing thousands and thousands of uh, community cat surgeries a year. So we discovered that it was really, you know, people on the ground, people who care about the cats, uh, people who feed them are the same everywhere. You know, they really care about their animals. Um, the vast majority of them understand that spay neuter is a good thing. They don't want more cats to feed. Um, they don't want a lot of cats, uh, you know, predating on wildlife, but they don't want to kill the cats uh, either. So um, really, you know, trap neuter return throughout Hawaii has grown explosively, um, not just because of us, but when we first got here, um, 
except for Maui, which had just changed, all, all the shelters on the islands had extremely high euthanasia, like 80% or higher cat euthanasia rates. And that's completely turned around now. And there are TNR programs available on all the islands. And um, so, you know, we, we've seen a tremendous amount of progress. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, I'm gonna let you continue on and then we'll have plenty, a little more time at the end for Q&A. We'll, we'll sure. cover all that. Great. Okay, great. Thanks, Stacey. Hey, everybody. Um, let's get back into the subject at hand. So we've talked about return to field, um, but I also wanna talk about uh, targeting and how it can be combined with return to field to make a full, the fullest possible community cat program because return to field on its own from a population reduction point of view and that is remember you know I, I see return to field as a part of a TNR program now that's something that's a separate thing all by itself it came out of TNR it's complementary to it and as I said before one of the main goals of trap neuter return programs on a community level is to have fewer unowned free roaming cats on the streets. So when you only do return to field, that can be a problem. So here's our return to field kitty. Remember we returned him to Main Street. Well, this is the backyard that he comes from. And the red circle in these graphics uh, signifies that he's a fixed return to field cat. So you put him back on Main Street. Now, if he's or she is the only cat in that area, uh, then you're fine right? This, this kitty is not going to contribute to any more um, reproduction. And you've done that. But if this cat was part of a colony of cats, of 10 cats, and um, as we said before, you know, when citizens do trapping, they tend to do it anecdotally. They don't know how many there are. They only have one trap. They put it out. Whoever goes in first gets caught. You end up with very low sterilization rates for that area. And now we have this one cat out of 10 who's fixed, that's not going to lead to population reduction. Those nine cats that are unaltered, and it could be seven cats or even six cats, if, if the person continues to trap and gets a few more, their reproduction is going to outpace uh, the lack, the loss of reproductive capacity. They're going to have more litters of kittens. They're going to be able to reproduce enough to maintain the carrying capacity of that environment. So if that environment can only handle 10 cats, fixing this one cat is not going to change that. Fixing two or three of these cats is not going to change that. You will continue to have 10 cats in this neighborhood. Um, and the return to field spay neuter in this situation will have contributed nothing to population control. Now, on the other hand, if we said, hey, where there's one, there's many, um, and we took this return to field cat to be a what we would call a red flag uh, or a scout or a, a sign that there are cats in this community, and then we not only return this cat, we send a trapping team out to that neighborhood and they talked to the feeders and they discovered where all the other cats are and they all got fixed. And that would be the blues, the blue circles would be the TNR cats. Now we have population control. Now we've integrated on the colony level, which is just talking about this particular group of cats. We've integrated return to field with TNR in a way that does lead to population reduction. Now, if we look at this, and here we are in Farrellville, for those of you who haven't been here for a while, it's a uh, city somewhere in the Midwest and looks like the state of Iowa. Um, this is what return to field, if you're only doing return to field, this is what it looks like, right? You've got random individual cats throughout the community that have been brought in and then returned back to where they came from. Great for those cats, great for the shelter, has all those benefits but does nothing to actually reduce the overall population of cats because there's the, the, the sterilization rates within any colony or any area are too low, unless that's the only cat that's, that's there. 
Now, when we combine return to field with colony level targeting, so we use the cats as a red flag, and wherever we return a cat, we also trap in that neighborhood, then that's what this looks like. You have the red circles are the return to field cats and the blue circles are the TNR cats. <clears throat> and excuse me, and within each colony that we deal with, we're getting high sterilization rates, not necessarily 100%, but we're getting high enough that there's a good chance that over time these numbers uh, will go down. So this is a one way to combine return to field uh, with with TNR, with targeted TNR. Um, by basically what you're doing is you're, we call it uh, the red flag approach, where the RTF cats are a red flag, that there are other cats in the area. And when you're talking about, if if you're measuring the impact of your return to field and overall what I would call community cat program, where return to field is one component, and you're measuring its effectiveness by your intake, by your cat intake, this uh, approach is going to be, um, could be very powerful at lowering intake because you're basically micro-targeting the sp specific locations where your impounded cats are coming from, right? Because these tend to be people who don't want the cats around and are active when uh, they see cats and they try to trap them, uh, you know, usually not very efficiently, but enough to, you know, fill your shelters. And then if you go to those exact locations, that street, that block, that backyard, and you get all the cats fixed and you get the reduction in nuisance behavior and you get there's no more kittens and you get attrition over time, um, you will have eliminated a lot of the sources of your intake, uh, the specific sources. So it can be very powerful when it comes to reducing intake. Um, however, and, and it can help with population reduction, but there is a problem with this approach when just talking about population reduction, not talking about intake lowering, talking about the number of cats that are in the community. And I wonder if, um, I'll give you just a moment. Does anybody know, anybody spot why this is not the most efficient way to reduce the population of cats? as opposed to um, lowering intake. I'll give you just a moment to think about that. Because this is definitely a viable approach. This is definitely a viable policy for a community cat program, but there's another one that might emphasize popula population reduction over intake reduction. Okay, so let me, let me explain it. Um, in order to understand this, let's go back to our grocery store. And um, the cats were not removed, those initial cats, let's say they were not removed, but instead uh, somebody at the grocery store, you know, who worked there, put out a trap, they caught one cat, brought them to the shelter, and now the shelter's got a return to field program, and that cat has come back, okay? But now we've combined our return to field program, we don't just put the one cat back. We say, ah, well, if this cat came from a grocery store with a dumpster in the back, there must be other cats there. So we'll send our trappers or our nonprofit partners or our good volunteers, whoever it might be, to go to the grocery store and get the rest of the cats TNR'd. And they do that, right? And now we've got a colony that's 100% fixed. So time goes by. Um, there's 10 cats, enough food for 10, it's a stable situation, but then over time, um, the population declines, which is what we want it to do. Now that you can see they're all ear tipped. And uh, maybe a couple of years go by, hopefully a lot longer, and we're down to five cats. What's the problem? More cats will come in. There's still food for 10, exactly. You guys are really good. You're still surrounded. You know, you still got colonies all over the place and community cats all over the place. And it's great that you've targeted the grocery store, but if you haven't targeted the entire area, well, you've got these colonies of cats that are 
uh, reaching their carrying capacity that need more food sources if more of them are going to survive. And you've got um, five cats at the grocery store with enough food for 10. Well, you know, guess what happens? Eventually, some of those cats from adjoining neighborhoods are going to come in. And you know that old maxim, you've, everybody's probably heard it, that, you know, one of the advantages of TNR is that the old cats keep the new cats away, right? They guard the territory. Well, that's not true if there's more than enough food for newcomers. Then they don't have that motivation. If there's 10 cats and enough food for 10, they will fight like hell to keep number 11 away. But if there's five of them and there's enough cats for 10, they don't much care whether six, seven, and eight come and, and, and share. OK, so you end up reversing some of the gains from a population point of view uh, that you got. So that, was, that remember that 10 went down to five. But now that, that you've created a, a inadvertently created a vacuum, that five maybe go back up to six, seven, eight. And some of the population reduction is lost. So how do we um, how do we uh, avoid that? Well, this is where community level targeting comes in. And, and we don't just stop at the grocery store. We, um, we, we identify this neighborhood as a high intake area, as a high need area. And we try to fix, we try to focus our TNR resources on the area and not just on the colony. And so we begin to, to distinguish we don't try to, we can't do the area for every single return to field colony, right? Every time we send a return to field cat, we can't do the entire zip code where they returned. So we have to start to try to identify um, what, uh, where they came from, right? And um, what areas are of particular need and where we should uh, focus our resources, and we spend our TNR time in that region. So it looks like this on a community level. When you do return to field combined with community level targeting, um, and not only colony level targeting. So you'll see in zip code one, two, and four, we're sending the cats back. Um, we're we're RTFing them, but we're not following up. Um, and the reason is because we've identified zip code number three as a high need zip code. And, and you can see that there's a disproportionately large number of cats in zip code number three compared to the rest of Farrellville. So that is the area where we want the most spay neuter. We want to focus our spay neuter. So you can see that we use the RTF cats as red flags um, and we uh, go into those colonies and try to get high sterilization rates, but we're also working in colonies where there were no return to field cats because they're in zip code number three. And this is going to get us, because it when all the colonies in zip code number three are fixed, you have um, almost el virtually eliminated the vacuum effect. There are no cats to migrate other than uh, lost and abandoned cats. Uh, and the occasional litter of kittens. And if you're on top of it, you can usually intervene pretty quickly. But you don't have um, a population of unaltered um, community cats who might be migrating between colonies and um, filling in a vacuum. So as the that colony in the middle of zip code number three is, is going down in size, ideally so are all the other colonies in zip code number three and you've eliminated the vacuum effect. And we have seen this play out in the real world. Uh, Newburyport, Massachusetts uh, was the first community-wide uh, TNR program in the country. And um, that was back in the 1990s. And they had about 300 cats living along the riverfront, which was a high tourist area. And um, over the course of time, they either adopted out or spayed and neutered every single cat. And um, the population just kept going down over time until eventually there was literally one 18-year-old cat left who had 34 feeders signed up to take care of him. And when he passed away, there, was, there were no more cats. And the reason that new cats didn't come in as the older cats died 
was because there were no new cats. Um, they had eliminated, uh, you know, all the sources of reproduction. And another real life example of um, how return to field can be combined with targeted TNR to have a really effective community cat program is, um, I mentioned earlier, the city of Albuquerque. So here's the progression that took place in that community. On their own in 2011, the Albuquerque Animal Welfare Department, which is the municipal uh, shelter and municipal animal control agency, they, they launched their own return to field program in 2011. And that's all they did for that year, only return to field. There was no follow-up TNR at all. In 2012, um, colony level targeting through a, through a grant um, with uh, Best Friends and PetSmart Charities, colony level targeting was added to the return to field program. So they started to use the red flag approach. And every time a return to field cat was brought back, trappers would enter the neighborhood uh, locate the additional cats and catch them and get them fixed too. That launched in April of 2012. Now simultaneously in another part of Albuquerque, there were um, a couple of private organizations. There's a private shelter animal, Humane New Mexico, and they had a, a, a rescue partner, New Mexico Animal Friends, and they targeted seven zip codes that were high intake to their shelter, not so much to the city shelter. That launched in July 2010 and grew more vigorous over the next, um, I think it went on for about five or six years where they were targeting. So you have um, all aspects of what we've been talking about today going on in the city of Albuquerque. And this is, this is what it looks like, the results. So 2010, you can see intake uh, to the municipal shelter was uh, just below 10,000. In 2011, return to field was introduced. And these numbers are just so interesting. So you can see that the return to field program immediately started to drop euthanasia um, from about 5,000 to about 3,700, um, roughly correlating to the number of cats that were returned to field, which would be the green bar. However, you don't see intake, and intake actually goes slightly up, not down. So you see the return to field program uh, when it's the only thing going on, having an, a, a pretty strong impact on euthanasia, but nothing on intake. 2012, we introduced colony level targeting um, as part of the re RTF strategy. Well, we, uh, we continue to see dramatic reductions in um, euthanasia, but now we start to see intake going down from uh, close to 10,000 to just over 8,000. And then in the ensuing years, with all the, the both the county level targeting and the community level targeting likely starting to kick in, we see a steady decline in intake year after year after year, along with the um, bottoming out of euthanasia rates. Now, this was not um, unique to Albuquerque because um, this same um, kind of project, which was an experiment at the time, this, this return to field and targeted uh, TNR had never really been combined in this way before. Uh, it was also carried out in six cities, five other cities in addition to um, Albuquerque. And um, for the most part, you see very similar results. Um, and you can see that uh, overall, this is this is over three years. I followed the numbers for for through um, several years, but th this was the first three years of the program. The numbers you're seeing here, um, you could see uh, feline intake going down. Other than the city of San Antonio, San Antonio, which had a kind of unique situation um, where uh, they they their intake was artificially low when the program started because um, of a number of policies. And when all of a sudden they were perceived as cat friendly, um, people started bringing lots of cats and kittens to, especially kittens to them. So that first year of the program actually saw intake jump, but thereafter it went down pretty steadily. Um, 
you see kitten intake dropping and you can see the, the euthanasia numbers on average were down um, 83% for across six different facilities, but also average lower intake of uh, 32%. And when you break it down to kittens, 40% fewer. So this is just over the course of three years in a variety of different types of um, communities and different locations in the South, in the West, in um, the Northeast. You can read about uh, th these. This chart is uh, taken from the article you see on the bottom there by um, Dan Spearer and Peter Wolf, and um, you know that's available online if you want to um, dig deeper into the numbers. But um, this has now become kind of the gold standard community cat program because it has such a powerful impact on both intake and euthanasia. So just a couple of um, points I want to highlight about the mechanics of, um, you know, identifying if you want to do community level targeting, how do you identify uh, where the high need areas are? So here's a few of ways you can do that, which is you can you can take your intake if you are tracking tracking it by whatever, you know, hopefully by street address, but even if it's only zip code, whatever it might be, you can um, map it like you see here and see where um, most of the cats are coming from. And that can give you a very good clue as to um, where to put your TNR resources uh, while you're returning field. Running, you could be RTFing cats throughout New York City. That's what this is a map of but then focusing your TNR resources within um, specific areas. So you can identify these um, areas by um, intake. You can also map uh, complaint calls, you know, or uh, if you're a rescue group or a private shelter, you can um, track requests for assistance. Whatever's coming in, you want to get an address associated with that. There's also what I call tribal knowledge which is just groups and um, you may law enforcement officers and directors of agencies who have been in the community for some time. Uh, they just know through experience where the hot spots are. And if their knowledge correlates to some um, kind of data, objective data, you've got a pretty good idea of where you need to go. Another clue um, has to do with the socioeconomic um, situation in in particular areas. And this is a study that was done by um, Dr. Gary Petronic, 2010. And his his map, what he created is the one on the right. And that's a that's maps intake uh, by neighborhood in Boston, in the city of Boston. And the orange, in is the highest cat intake areas. And you can see there's that band in the middle, Roxbury and the other um, three sections of Boston where the most cats are coming from. So I took that and I looked at a map of income levels in Boston around the same time that this, that Gary's research was done. And um, that's on the left, and the lower income areas are the darker red, the red and the darker orange. And you can see how that band of cat intake corresponds almost exactly to the lower income um, areas of Boston. So what a lot of people who are um, experienced on the ground already know through just their own personal experience, Poorer areas are associated, are correlated to higher free roaming cat populations. So that's a really good hint about where you need to go if you're looking to have the most impact in terms of targeting TNR is look to those poorer areas, those lower income areas, the ones without. And it makes a lot of sense, you know, um, uh, spay neuter is not high on the list of priorities when you're just struggling to get enough uh, to feed your kids every day or to get to work or whatever it might be. There also tends to be veterinary deserts where there isn't easy access to veterinary services. Um, so uh, spay neuter of pet cats 
in lower income areas, uh, households is much lower than in higher income, you know, for obvious reasons. So between the data you can generate on intake, complaint calls, tribal knowledge, and your understanding of the socioeconomic makeup of your community allows you to really zero in on those areas of, that are of high need. So um, got another book for you. Um, this is Community TNR Tactics and Tools, which is published by PetSmart Charities. Uh, this goes into uh, the mechanics of targeting um, in a lot more detail. I've just touched on a couple of the highlights, but this goes into the kind of how to do outreach, what kind of uh, personnel resources you need, um, how, where to hold the cats, you know, things like the, all the kind of the nuts and bolts of targeting, as well as some discussion about return to field and what I call grassroots mobilization, which is just getting the general public to contribute a lot of resources and do a lot of the hands-on work. So this is still... Um, I wrote this in 2014, uh, but you can still buy a copy of it on Amazon. You can uh, download the PDF file and click on this link, or just go to Amazon, and if you uh, put my last name, K-O-R-T-I-S, and CATS, or TNR, I'm sorry, put Cordis TNR, it'll come up. Um, if you prefer a PDF file, then shoot me an email, and, and I'll see what I can do. Um, it's Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at neighborhoodcats.org. So you can buy the print copy, but if you want a PDF, um, shoot me an email. So it's great. We have lots of time for questions. Um, just want to highlight a couple of other events that are coming up before we get there. Uh, as Stacy mentioned, we offer TNR certification workshops uh, every month, uh, Neighborhood Cats in partnership with the Community Cats podcast. And uh, the next one is December 4th. It's uh, $10, and it's basically an A to Z on the colony-level trapping, you know, and how to get high percentages of the cats in a particular area um, on the colony level uh, fixed. So um, check that out, or you can uh, present that to your community if you want people to be trained, which is, in my experience, always a very good idea before you allocate surg surgical slots to them. Also coming up in uh, January, uh, the Community Cats podcast will be presenting its annual online cat conference. And uh, it'll be January, Friday, January 28th. I believe it starts at, uh, was it 6 p.m. or 7 p.m.? And goes through uh, Saturday and Sunday as well. If you register now, um, you can get the whole weekend for just uh, $50. Again, download the handout and you can click on that link or go to the Community Cats podcast um, website to uh, to register. Um, we have a lot of questions and one of the times when we were sort of talking about doing this return to field presentation we talked a little bit about advocacy also as another sort of component um, and I know you have even a a handout or a brochure on like how to talk to public officials about TNR and community cats. And there's lots of questions about cats and birds out there. Um, and I think there was um, one question sort of covered it a bit. Um, so, you know, this person's talking about, you know, a local society, bird society, that's very vocal about colony cats, eating birds, spreading toxoplasmosis and other disease. You know, how can we advocate with our public officials as well as with our, you know, bird conservancy groups to, to share? I mean, where Newburyport is, that's like piping plover central. So we're like in birders heaven. So um, and luckily we seem to have kept the peace with everybody there. But um, other parts of the country, it's not that way. So when you're dealing with with conservationists. Or, or people who are concerned about wildlife. What the, the most important thing to focus on is that we as an animal welfare field and um, other people as part of the conservation field, we want the exact same thing. 
we want now we have different reasons, but we want fewer cats roaming around. I mean, I didn't get into TNR because I enjoyed feeding a colony of cats twice a day every day, or because I enjoyed spending my time and my money running around. Um, I mean, some of us do enjoy the trapping part of it, but you know, it, it wasn't. Um, we we would prefer to have a world in which you know cats were well cared for that they were provided for, they were not living on their own on the streets. You know, that is not what most people consider to be a natural. So we want there to be fewer of them. I've, I've said a couple of times in this presentation that one of the overarching goals of a community TNR program is to have fewer free roaming cats. Well, that's what the wildlife people want too, the bird people. Um, we may be more motivated by um, the welfare of the animals and they may be mo more motivated by having less predation. Bottom line is we want fewer cats. So the discussion, if you want it to be productive, has to focus on how do we achieve that goal? How do we get to fewer cats? If the discussion stays stuck on like, oh, the cats are killing the birds and the cats are spreading toxoplasmosis and the cats are the worst things since Satan visited, you know, in 1722 and, you know, the cats are responsible for killing the seals and the cats are responsible for this and the cat. Well, that doesn't get you to fewer cats. That's just playing the blame game, right? And if you can get past that and say, look, whatever, let's not argue about how many birds are being killed. Let's not argue about whether you know you're exaggerating the spread of toxoplasmosis let's talk about how we get to fewer cats and when you get to there uh, there aren't a whole lot of options you know um there's no i like to say the first thing i say to a group to an audience that's you know mostly interested in wildlife is hey i haven't got a magic wand in my bag here you know i can't just wave it and make all the cats go away we actually have to do something, all right? So let's look at what's been tried in the past and let's look at what's worked and let's do that. And when you do that, you get to like, you can't just kill them all. You can't just pick them all up one day and make them disappear. It doesn't work for all the reasons we discussed today. On the other hand, we have seen situations where trap neuter return was done in an intensive targeted way. Um, where the community through return to field programs and, and other um, policies were uh, educated to pursue trap to spay neuter as a way of population control. And we've seen these dramatic improvements. And um, that's what the discussion needs to be on. Now, you may not sway all the bird people, but it's the policymakers that you're trying to sway. And in the end, they care more about having fewer cats than they care about how many birds are being killed. I mean, they want fewer birds killed, but they don't really care whether it's a thousand or 10,000. They just want fewer cats. And because if you have fewer cats, you're going to have fewer deaths. So that's my big lesson when I teach advocacy is don't get stuck in arguing about all the potential ills that cats have. Like, you know, you, you'll get a long, like, if you read a typical conservation article about free roaming cats, the first 19 out of the 20 paragraphs are gonna be about how horrible the cats are and all the disease they spread and all the species they've wiped out and the threat that they are to biodiversity and all that. And then you'll get to paragraph number 20, which uh, will have a throwaway line about what you're supposed to do about it. you know, Or it might just say, and, and so they shouldn't be there. Um, but when you really press them, like, well, what do you mean? You know, then you start getting really silly answers like, well, they should be fenced in in empty suburban lots or you know uh, we, you know if 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 we educate people enough they'll all despite all the public surveys they'll want to kill them they'll want to get rid of them um so there's still the conservation field is still a little bit in la la land when it comes to how do you actually reduce cat populations policymakers are not they want results so stick to the facts stick to talking about solutions just concede that there are problems and avoid debating about the extent of them so would you advocate, I don't know, approaching, working with, creating a good, solid relationship more with your board of health folks, your animal control, like spend more of your time and energy on that battle than maybe some of the more public other stuff? Yes. Yes. The birds versus cats 
um, battle is a very uh, media attractive one. They love to play that up. They love the cats and the birds fight. Um, but that's not, you know, it's like when, when this huge, it, it's really just a piece of propaganda that came out from the Smithsonian Institution, like, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago. And it was like the cats are killing, you know, X billions of birds a year in North America. Um, it's an incredibly flawed study. It wasn't meant to be a scientific study. It was meant to be a piece of propaganda that got a lot of media attention and it worked, it did. And people were coming to me and saying, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna correspond to, you know, respond to this? And, and my uh, reaction was, we're not going to respond to this. We're going to carry on with our work and we're going, and, and, in, and in a month or two, no one's gonna be talking about this anymore. And there's still gonna be a lot of cats out there and there's still gonna be a problem to solve because all this distraction about the cats and the birds doesn't help anyone. Doesn't help the cats, doesn't help the birds. So, and we uh, encountered the same thing here in Hawaii, you know, um, when they get to a point where there's, if they're trying to pass legislation that would limit the practice of trap, neuter, return, or limit the ability to spay, neuter cats, um, then we're gonna fight them tooth and nail. But if they're just spouting propaganda and stuff, we're just going ahead. We're just working. We're just fixing cats and you can not like it if you don't want to. The door is always open to work together. One of the things that we do is we try to be responsible. Um, now, we, we've tried to have talks and sometimes they've been successful with conservationists about, all right, you know, like we don't want to put cats in a bird sanctuary. I don't think that's a good idea, especially if they're endangered so we don't you know we'll relocate them i've even you know at, at at times when there was no relocation resources available um i've been open to euthanasia we're talking less than a handful you know of cats but when there was absolutely nowhere for them to go except back in the middle of a sanctuary where there were endangered bird ground nesting birds then i couldn't agree to that i couldn't do that to the birds so we on our own without cooperation and agreement with the wildlife people um, try to be sensitive to to these areas that are um, you know set aside for wildlife set aside for species that could be harmed by cats and um, like I say it's I could count on you know one or two times where we um, just didn't have any other alternatives um, most of the time there are uh, non-lethal ways of working things out so be responsible, be respectful of wildlife, but if the wildlife people won't work with you, just, just plow ahead. Just go about it and continue in a responsible way. Keep the door open for discussions because, you know, eventually things change and more reasonable people hopefully will, will step in. Um, one person was asking questions about, um, you know, how do you, or uh, how have you tracked complaints or is there like a standard format for tracking complaints to have, if you've asked your animal control officer, is that something that they do on a regular basis that they have to track their complaint calls and are we able to ask for that information? Well, you're certainly able to ask for that information. So different agencies will have different data collection policies, but your, your better agencies, yeah, they track everything. You know, they track um, what kind of complaint, they track when it came in, they track where it came from. Um, they break it into spreadsheets that can be sorted so you can, you know, identify zip codes. That kind of data is available. Um, always better to take a cooperative approach because you want to, you know, work with um, agencies. If they are funded by the government, you may be able to submit a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, to get that kind of information, but try to go the cooperative route um, because you're going to need to work together in the future. And if, um, look, I always say that, you know, if the data collection is not where you need it to be and you don't have street addresses and you don't have uh, any idea where calls are coming from or cats are coming from, then start. And you can do that as a rescue group. You can be a small rescue group, and when people call up and they want help with a cat, you can ask them, where are you? And put it down on a spreadsheet. And after a year, you'll have enough data to be able to identify what parts of your community are the most uh, in need. 
If your local spay neuter clinic um, or rescue group um, doesn't really have anything, a specific program or anything for the uh, the TNR certificate that we do on a monthly basis, you know, why would somebody want to get certified through our program? Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of advantages to it. Um, if you're running, if, if you're a spay neuter clinic, if you're allocating spay neuter surgeries, having people trained means that they're going to be more efficient. They're going to fill the slots. They're, um, they're going to know how much time to take. They're going to know the proper. So um, certification was introduced in New York City because uh, the ASPCA was offering free spay neuter on their mobile clinics and they would give out 25 spots and somebody would show up with 10 cats and 15 slots would be wasted. So they started to require people to be certified and trained. And then they found that percentage went way up. So you got more efficient uh, trappers if, from a clinic point of view. If you're just, if you're not, if you're working on your own, you're not a clinic, um, the advantages are, well, first of all, just you'll know better. <laughs> you'll be a better trapper. You'll be more efficient. Uh, you'll use your resources more wisely. Um, but also it gives you uh, credibility. So part of being a, an effective TNR worker is um, knowing why TNR is a good thing, is understanding the long-term process and being able to explain it to other people. And if you can show that you've been trained, then you've got more credibility. Um, it, it, it'd be like the same with anything. You know, if I've taken accounting classes and I'm starting to tell you what this financial statement says, I have more credibility because I'm trained. I've, I've looked at these things as opposed to somebody who just picked it up for the first time and has no, um, there's no objective way of judging. So for your own knowledge and for to boost your own credibility, um, you mentioned that group in Long Island where they, uh, everybody needs to be certified when, because they want to know when they're work that they're working with people who know what they're doing, who are trained, who speaking the same language. So that that 10 bucks goes uh, an awful long way. <laughs> Going sort of on that same theme, uh, if you are out there and you're just you're trapping on your own and you would like to have some support, get to know other trappers in your area that are doing TNR that support, you know, how can they find each other? Oh, well, good question. I mean, um, I've got, maybe you want to throw that slide up about um, the different uh, social media networks that are available uh, through Neighborhood Cats and through the Community Cats podcast. You can join one of those uh, Facebook groups and immediately link in. Um, I'm finding that in more and more, like on, on uh, Maui, there's a Facebook group uh, that's now called the Cat Network of Maui, I, I, something like the Good Cat Network. I, Anyway, it's, it started off like maybe a couple of years ago, and now it's got close to 2,000 people on it. And they're problem solving all the time. You know, somebody needs a microchip scanner, somebody found a cat, somebody's w whatever problem it is. In New York City, we have um, an online uh, discussion group where, again, um, there's hundreds of people on it, and they uh, work with each other. They, they communicate. They, they, um, somebody needs a slot for a pregnant cat. Um, somebody needs somebody to feed their colony for a couple of days and they begin to connect. So if you don't have that in your community, you can start it, you know, start a Facebook group and, you know, make it specifically for um, community cats in your area. Um, look to the national groups. I'm sure Alley Cat Allies probably has a pretty vigorous Facebook or some type of online discussion group. Um, uh, there's the Feral Friends Network, so there's a lot of there's a lot of um, just do a little bit of basic research and you'll find these uh, online communities. And there's also a Community Cats United, and they have regional oh, right. sections. Um, they have a, a lot of different segmented uh, Facebook groups, and I travel around in, in that network. And we have. Um, you know, an online cat conference group. If if you want to get connected, you can always feel free to email me at Stacy at communitycatspodcast.com and I'll do everything to try and get you connected through uh, to somebody in your area. Um, there's a, a Pittsburgh feral cat group that's coming through here. 
Um, I think I am in that group. Yep. And, um, yep. And then, um, uh, Donna is here from Long Island, which started this spay neuter appointment swap group. So she's here. So thankful, thankful for the shout out. So it's good. Yeah. Um, so I understand that. Yeah. It's, and I, I, I encourage people to get connected in some way because the, the, the hands-on work can be something that's very, you're doing very much alone. You know, you're trapping, you're alone with the cats, you're taking care of them. And it can start to feel very isolating, especially if you're in a community where these programs are new um, and there may not be a lot of understanding and there may be some hostility. Uh, it's very important to understand that you're far from alone, that there are literally millions of people in this country who are doing the same thing. And uh, get yourself connected. Take advantage of the internet. Yep, for sure, for sure. And um, also, I'll just mention if you want to, you can even check out like some of the low cost spay neuter clinics and their social media. So mm -hmm. you can go to the you know United Spay Alliance's website and search on your state. We're trying to get the spay neuter clinic listings up there, and um, search for the clinics near you and join their social media. And I would think that they would also have folks that you can connect in with. So a variety of different angles, but. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does take a little bit of work on on that. Um, and and for those of you who don't like Facebook groups, I respect your social media desires and all of that. It's it is it is really um, really challenging for sure. Um, someone was trying to convince me the other day to have a clubhouse, do clubhouse for all of us and all that kind of stuff. So. There, there are some other avenues that probably will be developing. So we may be talking about other things maybe in, in the years to come. I think this is, this is, you know, um, Stacey, let me, let me throw out one other thing, Yeah. which was, you know, uh, we're talking about a post pandemic world, you know, or a highly vaccinated world. But when we started neighborhood cats in New York city, it was just a few volunteers and very little, very few resources. Um, but what we were doing was very much new to to most of our community. And we just let it be known through the grapevine that on the first, I think, Tuesday evening of every month, we would be at Starbucks uh, and anybody could come and, and ask us questions and have a discussion about community cats. And that went on for the first couple of years. And every the first Tuesday of every month, we would have people come from all over the city and they would have a advanced questions or they would have beginning questions. And um, that discussion group became the foundation of what is now thousands and thousands of people, you know, throughout New York City who are doing this. So just something as simple as that uh, can go a long way. Yeah, and, and I'm happy to help anybody if they want to do some outreach in their local areas and have ideas and support. Um, it, it, you know, it takes Many hands make light work, and it also, you know, takes a village too. So I'm happy to help anybody with trying to create um, another, you know, another group, another um, organization, or just a, a neighborhood. Oh my goodness! Look at that it's face. My, my, my 19 year old. There you go. Oh, Hi. look at that face. <laughs> oh, so he so. Into my lap. Oh, that's so great. He um, was from so the I very think, first yeah. colony. Very first colony that I uh, took care of, he came running up one day going, meow, 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 meow. And I was like, what are you doing here? You know, so I ended up taking him home and here he is <laughs> 19 years later. So that happened to me. I was walking back from having ice cream in Newburyport. I was walking back to my apartment <laughs> and this little voice, meow, meow, big barking voice. And I was a little eight week old kitten um, and ended up being Steffi. And we checked the whole neighborhood. Nobody owned her or anything. And um, that was back in 1992. She lived to be 20. Wow. Yep. 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 She was deaf, at a, deaf as a doornail at the end. You could do whatever you wanted, and she wouldn't hear a thing. So <laughs> He's not deaf yet. But, <laughs> but anyway, so everybody, I want to thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Susie, thank you so much for a great presentation. Susie was in the background answering tons of questions. She makes these events so easy. If we missed any questions, um, we will be reviewing them. But I think she's been able to keep on top of everything. 
And I want to thank all of you for attending, for joining us. And thank you all for turning your passion for cats into action and check out the Community Cats podcast. I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving holiday. I'm grateful for everything that you do.